Good evening. evening. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you uh, as we come into your house tonight, Lord, that we can stand in awe of you. Lord, our great King, our Savior, the one who came to earth and died for us, help us to look to you tonight, Lord, in every situation in our lives. Help us to stand in awe of who you are. So we love you. We thank you. We give you the praise and glory. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Better than all this world, better than all I know, better than life itself, your love is. All that I have is yours, all that I'm living for, all that I need is in
The more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you, the more, the more I seek you, the more I find you the more I find you the more I love you I want to sit at your feet drink from the cup in your hand lay back Go. 
that your word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Thank you, Lord, for your great love.
seated. We have a very small group in church tonight, so hopefully you all are online paying attention. 
or you're watching this later, but hopefully you're participating with us now. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, we're going to go to James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. You know, life in a fallen world is not easy. Who said it was supposed to be easy? Was it, was it my mom used to say life is never supposed to be easy? You know, bad things happen, tragedies happen, sickness and death are unavoidable. And at times, as we, we even see through scripture and even in our modern day world, uh, persecution for the believer is a part of life. And, and in fact, rather than not suffering because we are children of God, we pick up a new reason to suffer, right? So we may have suffered for other reasons before we were Christians, but as Christians, we pick up a new reason to suffer. And so last week we saw that some of the rich landowners were stealing from and treating the poor horribly. And we saw that back in chapter 2 of James as well, when the church is told the rich drag them into court, right? And so James is written in this context. So think about that time of suffering, and he's, it's written in that context of vulnerability. And, and we know the early church suffered, right? The early church suffered. There was much injustice and there was much uh, wrong treatment. And we saw in James chapter 1 that as believers, we are called to be steadfast. Steadfast, stand fast, right? When we encounter trials. And God uses those trials to prove and strengthen our faith. And so today we're going to see that we need to be patient in suffering. Patient in suffering. But as a reminder, let's go back to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, where he says, My brethren, this is a hard one for a lot of people to swallow, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Right? We all want to cry when we fall into trials, not have joy. <laughs> and he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So that tells me in order to have patience in my life, my uh, faith has to be tested. And he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So without patience, we're not going to be perfect and complete and we will be lacking. Then he says, if any of you lack wisdom, so if you don't understand what's going on, let him ask of God. He, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But then he gives us another caution here, but then let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. And I know I go to the Lord sometimes, I'm like, Lord, I need this, you know, kind of, sort of, if you really want to, you know, maybe... That's kind of doubting, right? And the Lord says, come with faith and not doubting. You know, think about the stock market for a moment. If you have a retirement fund or if you invest in any way, you know the key to investing is patience. Is patience. You just don't put the money in one day and get rich the next day. Things go down, things go up, and in time, hopefully, things tend to go on an upward spiral. But there is no guarantee. But you generally have to wait things out. Uh, you have to be in it for the long haul. And similarly, in the Christian life, we have to hang in there. And we have to hang in the long haul even when things don't seem to be going well. And we're to patiently wait in this life because we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. And so the key to suffering well is suffering with patient endurance. So let's look at James chapter 5, 7 through 12. He says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the Lord is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have, heard that of the you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by oath or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, 
lest you fall into judgment. There's a lot there. But the big themes in this passage are to be patient and steadfast, standing firm in suffering. And the big idea is that all believers will encounter suffering. If you're a believer and you haven't encountered suffering, good, I'm glad, but you will, right? We will encounter suffering in this life, and it needs to be met with patient endurance. And we're not to become frustrated. We are not to turn to God, turn on God and not to turn on one another. We're to stay focused and we're to keep our heads and our faith with our eyes fixed on Jesus as we run the race. Look to the mark, awaiting for his return. You know, patience in our day and age is hard. We all have microwaves at home, right? We can't cook a meal anymore. That's going to take an hour. We've got to have a three-minute meal. We have fast food. And if they take more than two minutes in the drive-thru, we're mad. We have online shopping. We don't even have to get out of our house to go shopping anymore. And if you're an Amazon Prime person, you're Prime shipping, right? You can get it shipped faster to your house. And for me, I don't even watch like network TV anymore. I watch TV without ads because I don't want to wait through the ads, right? And so we don't like to wait in our time because we don't have to wait. Then we get impatient, right? Because we're so used to not waiting. So when we stop at the traffic light and it takes longer to turn than we want, we get mad, right? You know, even a leisurely game can turn into how quick can we play this game and be done? <laughs> Wait a minute, we're supposed to be resting and, and playing a game together, right? But we want to get over it. And so we don't like to wait. And, and as our time, as time has gone on, it feels like that waiting, that patience for waiting is less and less. You know, I go to the grocery store, and especially if I need to pick up a few items. I, w I went to the store on Monday, I think. And I, I grabbed a few items, and as I'm going up to the checkout, I'm counting my items to hope I have less than 10, because then I can go into the quick aisle, right? Because I don't want to wait for the long aisle. And then if I have 12, maybe I'll round them down to 10. I don't know. But my point is, is that, that we try to purposely avoid situations where patience is needed. On purpose, we avoid things where it's going to take time. Or we, we think, well, i got to go do this, but it's going to take me too much time today, so I'll wait and do it another day. Or i got to go here, like if I have to go grocery shopping on a Saturday, it won't happen. Because I know the grocery store is full, and I know it's going to take me twice as long, and I'm not patient. So I, I, I'll do it another day. And it's hard to know if you're patient or not if you don't practice patience. Think about that. It's hard to know if you have patience or not if you don't practice it. But when we suffer, it demands patience. In life, we find ourselves focused into, or forced into situations where we find out if we have that fruit of the Spirit. Patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? We see in Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or another word for that is patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such there is no law. So as believers, we're called to be patient. We're called to be patient, and we're called to patiently endure suffering. So how do we do that? How can we do that? So the text that we read tonight, James 5, 7 through 12, gives us some key, uh, keys to patiently enduring our trials. And we're going to talk about how we need to look up and we need to look in and we need to look around and we need to look back. Good? So first we need to look up at his hope. Look up at our hope at Christ. Look up at my hope. So James tells them to be patient until the coming of the Lord. Right? Be patient, the Lord is coming. You know, patience is always about tension. You're always in the in-between. You're waiting for something to happen. You, you're here and you want to get here, and patience is in the in-between. So you, patient, you, wait, you patiently wait for a meal. There's that tension of being hungry, right? Because you usually don't eat unless you're hungry. So there's that tension of being hungry, but you still have to wait till the, mood, the food is done. There's that you patiently deal with a person at work, and so there's a tension of being uh, not being rude or argumentative. Or maybe you patiently endure your job that you don't like because you're waiting and you're working towards another job, a better job. The point is, is we're looking to something that brings resolution. So when a trial comes, the resolution is here, and so that patience or that tension in between is that we're waiting for something to happen until the solution is there. So in, our, in, in my illustration, it's a meal. So you're going to patiently wait. It could be, I, I patiently wait to get home, or I patiently wait for a new job. So in suffering, there is a tension. And we suffer in this life, but we do know that better days are coming. Jesus is coming back. We will be in better days, right? Christ will re return, 
and he will come to put an end to all pain and all suffering once and for all. It'll be over. There will be a day when patience is not needed anymore. Won't that be good? Praise the Lord. You know, we read in James 5, 7, Therefore be patient, brethren, until... That tells me after he comes, I don't need to be patient anymore because it's not going to be needed. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. So James is illustrating with a farmer. And James is saying the farmer is patient. He's waiting for his fruit. Those of you who have ever planted a garden know that you don't put the seed in today and go eat your fruit tomorrow. It does not happen, right? The early and the late rains, in this case, were months apart, right? When we, uh, if those of you who farmed or planted a garden, you get late rain in the spring, get late rain in the fall, but you get rain throughout the summer. So the farmer had to patiently wait. And so as we, as believers, go through suffering, particularly if we suffer unjustly, we have to be patient and know that the desired outcome, the seed of faith in our life, is sure to come. There's a seed that's been planted. The fruit will come. The bugs are back? Those bugs. It's the fall. This box elder bug. So the seed, of, well, it, whatever that patient is brewing, will surely come. And so when Christ comes, we're going to be transformed, right? And, but the unrighteous outside of Christ, we know, will be judged. The persecuted and the mistreated do not have to execute vengeance. If you've been persecuted in this life, it's not your place to execute vengeance. Because God will perfectly execute his justice when the time is right. He will vindicate his people who were persecuted. The farmer has no control over the sun. The farmer has no control over the rain. The farmer has no control over the temperature. He simply has to wait. Once the seed is planted, he has to wait. God does the rest, right? There's a lot about farming that the farmer can't control, isn't there? He can't make the rain fall. He can't say, seed, hurry up and grow because it's getting colder early this year. He just has to wait. And so there's a lot, uh, uh, there has to be a lot of patient waiting also in life. In life, we have to simply patiently sometimes wait for the Lord, right? To fulfill his promises. We know what his promises are. They're in the book. They're yes and amen as we read. And so we have to wait for him to fulfill his promises like the one that he will return. He has promised us he will return. We don't know when he'll return. We may not be able to control when he will return. We're to simply patiently wait till he returns. In verse 5, 8, chapter 5, verse 8, he says, You also be patient, establish your hearts. You also be patient, establish your hearts. In other words, his, re uh, sorry, for the, let me read the rest of the verse. I don't know why I had it blocked out. You don't have to put it up because you don't have it. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Those words, is at hand, means his return is imminent. It's happening soon, right? Um, you know, the last days started when Jesus died. We've, we've been in the last days. And the length of this age is unknown. And we don't know when Christ will return, so we should live every day expecting Christ to return. If we jump all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 12, it says, Jesus said, and behold, I am coming, how slow? Quickly, right? And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So as believers, the return of Christ is our great hope. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we know is going to happen. We eagerly should be awaiting his return. We're going to be in a new heaven. We're going to be on a new earth. And yes, he will be the one who brings judgment. So it's our job to preach the gospel. It's our job to tell about Jesus. It's our job to tell about the Jesus coming to earth and dying for our sins and rising again from the dead and sending the Holy Spirit to inside of us. It's our job to tell people that they're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Because that's how we avoid others from entering into judgment. We share the gospel with them. So in suffering, we are to patiently look up because Jesus is coming back, right? Live every day looking up, longing for his return. How would you live differently if you knew that Jesus was just going to return any minute? How would you live differently? What would you do different? Would you share the gospel with other people differently than you do today? Who would you be sharing it with? Who would you share with one more time, right? 
How would you invest your time, your gift, your abilities, and your resources? How would it change your relationships if you knew that tomorrow was the day? How would you live, right? We're to live each day with patience and expectancy, taking heart, take heart in suffering because it won't be forever. Number two, so first we're to look up for our hope. Number two, we're to look in at my heart. So back to James 5, 8. He says, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So a key to patient endurance of trials in, is in light of the Lord's return is to establish your heart. Establish here in the Greek can be defined as to be resolute, to prop it up, to fortify your heart. That's what he's saying. The New American Standard uh, Bible says it this way, you too be patient strengthen your hearts we're to build that heart up strengthen your hearts for the coming of the lord is near so that's that literal greek of of uh in the new king james and establish your heart means to strengthen your heart and so what's commanded then is is that we have to have a, a firm adherence in the faith in the midst of any trials in the midst of any temptations and we're to wait patiently for the lord and then while we're waiting patiently, we need to be fortifying, securing our hearts, protecting our hearts. Because the struggle, the struggle against, there is a struggle against sin, and there's a struggle against difficult circumstances. And so we all, as humans, have this inner disposition that says, I'm hanging with Jesus is where we're supposed to be, right? I'm hanging with Jesus. I'm not giving up. I believe. I trust in God. It's by God's grace being committed to Christ, and we await his return. Suffering is painful, right? That's why it's called suffering. The temptation to sin and the temptation to wander is real in our lives. And so we need to keep a check on our hearts. Look in, how is your heart? How is your heart? Are you fortifying it? How do we establish or strengthen our hearts? We fill it with God's spirit, right? We fill it with God's word. We worship God, we, so we have communion with God. We spend time with God's people, and we pray and communicate with God. You know, I, we've had a lot of hurricanes in the south this year, and when they're coming, the people start prepping, right? They get the plywood out, and they board up their windows, and they board up the doors if you're in a hurricane zone, and they go into hurricane prep mode, and they board up the windows, and they fortify the houses, and they fortify the businesses because they know a storm is coming, right? Hurricanes never hit by surprise, usually, they know they're coming. And so they fortify their houses and business, businesses. So it's important then that we tend to our hearts in suffering, right? You never need God's people or God's word more than when you're going through trials and when you're more than you're going through challenges or more, more, more than when you're going through sufferings of various kinds. So in all trials, it's important to tend to your heart. Buckle up for the storm like they do for a hurricane. Fortify your heart. And so we need to tend to our heart in times like we're in now, when we, when we can't come together like we want to, or there's social unrest or social un injustice. And so if you're, uh, if you're not able, uh, for some of you, or you're, maybe you're not ready to gather here in person yet, be sure to participate online. Be sure to stay in the Word at home, even if it's not Sunday. Get in the Word on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Worship at home. You don't have to wait till church to worship. Stay connected to Jesus. You know, if you're like me, you're sick of virtual stuff. I'm sick of virtual stuff, right? But until we can all come back in person, until you're ready, you do need something. So try some virtual church, right? So our life, our life choices, as we've been learning for James and from James and we've been learning on Sunday, all come from the heart, right? Everything in the heart will pour out, right? And so we've seen in James... Uh, a big part of that is our words. Our words come from our heart. Our words say something about our lives. Look at James 5.12 again. He says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. So James's point here is not, you can't swear under oath, oath in court. That's not what he's saying. It's that we should live in such a way that in our normal daily lives, people shouldn't need us to swear oaths, to believe us. They shouldn't need us to go, oh, I swear an oath, please believe me. We should be living with such integrity that we should be people of our word and we should do exactly what we say we're going to do. 
and that we're so consistent that our word is good for those that we interact with. So if we say yes, people know we mean yes. And if we say no, people mean no, that we mean no. And if we tend to our hearts and take care of our hearts, the speech will follow, right? How we live when we suffer does matter. How we live in trials does matter. How we live in a fallen world does matter. How we speak, being a person of your word, it does matter, right? It all flows from the heart, so we need to look in and tend to the heart. Number three, so we need to look up to my hope, we need to look into my heart, and we need to look around to our relationships. We read in James 5, 9, do not grumble against one another, brethren. How many of you have ever grumbled? Katie grumbles all the time. No, she doesn't. Lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. So how should we treat others around us when we're suffering, especially other believers? James says, don't grumble, right? Don't grumble against one another. Why? So that you may not be judged. Jesus is our judge, and he takes how we treat one another very seriously. We're to love one another, the Bible says, right? We're, we're to love one another. And, and we're most likely to grumble. We're most likely to become frustrated when we're irritated. If I ever grumble, it's usually because I'm irritated or frustrated, right? Or when we're stressed. That's when the grumbling and the irritation comes. And when does that happen? Usually during difficulty, during pressure, we're, or pressed, during trials or during sufferings. You know, have you ever had a bad day and you go home, and after a bit your spouse or your family says, what is the matter with you? <laughs> Because you're just like taking everything out on them, right? We have a tendency to take our frustrations out on those who are closest to us, our, our family. And believers are our spiritual family. We as believers are a family. And so when we're suffering and when we're in a trial and the temptation is to become more and easily frustrated with one another and we begin to grumble, that's the wrong thing to do, right? And so we get through trials and suffering together. We usually don't do it alone. We usually do it together. And so God's people are part of God's recipe for helping us through difficulty. But the temptation is to push others away. If I'm stressed, I'm going to push you away. If I'm frustrated, I'm going to push you away. The temptation is to become more irritated. The temptation is to pick a fight. I'm irritated, so I'm going to pick a fight. The temptation is to become je uh, jealous and covetous and, and to grumble. But the same spirit that is to permeate the church in all seasons, not just during trials, has to continue to permeate the church in suffering. Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 12 through 14, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That's how we should live with each other. We need one another. We need other Christians. So when you suffer, look around. Ask, how am I treating my brothers and sisters? And do that all the time. How am I treating my brothers and sisters when life is good? Because... If we push each other way before the suffering hits, then we're going to be in trouble. So if I'm irritating and I'm grumpy and I'm, and I'm ornery and I grumble even when life is good, boy, am I really going to grumble when I suffer or when I'm in trouble. And Christ will judge, Christ our judge will return. And so let us be found bearing with one another in that kindness, in that humility, in that patience and love, not grumbling. Number four. Look back at my perspective. So look up at my hope, look in at my heart, look around at my relationships, and look back at my perspective. So we read in James 5, 10 through 11, as an example of suffering and patience, indeed we count them blessed who endure. That's enough right there, right? As an example of suffering and patience, indeed we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So James encourages us to look back at the examples before us. The prophets, for example. The people that he points out spoke in the Lord's name, right? They were God's men and they were fulfilling the calling that God put on their life as they suffered. 
And so being God's prophets did not exempt them from suffering. In fact, it led to more persecution, right? Just go back to the Old Testament. I'm going to give you a couple of examples in a minute. Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they all suffered. You know, we studied Daniel earlier this year. He was captured. He was exiled from his land. But those people were uh, steadfast. They were faithful. They endured, and we consider them blessed. And we know God worked in them and through them. You know, look at Hebrews 11. You know, God's hall of fame, hall of faith, as you call it. And uh, there's a long list, the writer says, in Hebrews 11.32. And what more shall I say, for the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Then jump to the verse 35 through 38. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And I cry if I have to grocery shop on a Saturday. So be encouraged. We're not the first to suffer, right? When mistreated, we're not the first uh, uh, for that. We're not the first ones being mistreated. Most of us will never reach the suffering that these folks have reached, right? We're not going to get sawn in half. Most of us won't, right? Most of us won't have to wander the wilderness in sheepskins and goatskins and wander in deserts and mountains and caves. And so when mistreated, uh, we're not the first. When you suffer especially for good, you're in good company, right? You're around other people in, in the faith that have suffered with you. And when we consider these people, we call them blessed. They're our heroes of faith. And so we trust that God took care of them. We know that God took care of Ezekiel. We know that he took care of Daniel. We know that he took care of Job. We know that he took care of all these people. And so the author of Hebrews uses Job as an example of steadfastness in suffering, right? The story of Job is that example of faithful steadfastness but even more of divine purpose. God had a purpose through Job's suffering. The, the blessedness that came to him eventually was not a fairy tale ending in which he lived happily ever after. It was the objective of God's form, or of God from the start. Above all, it was the enrichment of knowing God more fully. That was what the, the goal, to, the, to know God more fully. And so God showed his compassion in the mercy of Job's life. God showed his compassion in the mercy throughout scripture. You see it all over. God show, has shown his mercy and compassion in all of our lives. You know, we can look to the prophets, we can look to Job and the like, and we can learn about God through their suffering. It teaches us who God is, what his character is like, and what his mercy is like. And as we learn our own, as, as, as we learn that in our own, uh, as we learn that in our own, I'll get it right, we look back to remember that one thing God will teach us when we suffer is that he's compassionate. Another thing he teaches us when we suffer is that he's merciful, right? The main way we know that God is compassionate and merciful is Jesus. Look at Jesus. He sent his son. God the son took on human flesh and he went without sin, but he suffered and died. He suffered, right? Jesus knew suffering. I think it was Augustine who said, God had one son on earth without sin but never one without suffering. God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. So it's Jesus who suffered for us. Jesus suffered for us. He, and it was a suffering that he didn't deserve. He suffered for my sin. He suffered for your sin. He suffered in our, because he suffered in our place, we can receive then God's compassion and we can receive God's mercy instead of God's judgment and God's wrath, because Jesus suffered for us. I'm going to have you stand if you would. So he's coming back. We have to know him. Amen? You know, suffering in this life isn't fun. Some of us have suffered more than others, right? It's not fun. But eternal suffering in hell is unimaginable, right? Suffering in this life is not, has nothing uh, against suffering uh, eternally in hell. But that's avoidable. That's avoidable. All we have to do is look to Jesus and be saved. 
And when we trust Jesus, right, and we're saved, he gives us the Holy Spirit. We get God's presence with us in our suffering. We get all things that work together for good, right? And so don't suffer in this life without Jesus. I see people all the time in, in, at the coffee shop or all the time in my walks of life who are suffering without Jesus. And I can't imagine how they get from day to day. Because suffering with Jesus is even, it's difficult. But I can't imagine suffering without Jesus. So we don't need to suffer in this life without Jesus. We're to trust him. And so as believers through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can patiently endure suffering. So I'll let you throw those four points back up. We are to look up because our great up, right, and our great hope is Jesus' return. And we're to wait with expect, expectation. We're to look in. We're to guard our heart. We're to establish our heart. We're to fortify our heart. We're to look around. We need other believers. We need the church. We're not to grumble at each other. And we're to look back and see what great examples we have and have been encouraged by none other greater than Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. So Lord God, we just thank you that we can endure suffering. Lord, that we can be patient through suffering. Lord, that you, uh, James says, uh, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into tr uh, tr various trials or trials of various kinds. Lord, help us to endure that suffering. Help us to be patient. Help us to, to live in that tension of where that suffering begins and the solution is at the end. Lord, and grow us during that time. Lord, as a seed is planted in the soil, we have to patiently wait for that seed to grow. And so, Lord, whatever trial we may be going through, whatever struggle we may be going through, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is the end of that trial. And the end of that trial may be that Jesus comes back. I don't know. And every trial is different. But there's always an end to the trial. So help us to endure patiently, Lord. Help us to look up and look to you for your returning with expectancy. Lord, what if you were coming back tomorrow? How would we live our lives differently? Help us to look in at our hearts and fortify our hearts, just like as we talked about a hurricane that comes and we fortify our houses. Lord, there's storms in this life that we know may hit us, so we need to fortify our hearts and use the word of God and worship and pray and fortify the hearts with the things of the Spirit. Lord, we're to look around us and we're to, to love each other, we're to depend on each other, not grumble against each other. And Lord, we're to look to those behind us. We, we see all through scripture people who suffered. We look through scripture and we see people who, who were persecuted. Lord, we look through scripture and we see people who, who lived unimaginable lives. Lord, but you had mercy and compassion on them. And Lord, I thank you that because Christ died for each one of us on the cross, you have mercy and compassion for us. Lord, I thank you that you delight in showing mercy. We love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love knows no end. Amen.
two verses again. that you are with us through our suffering. Thank you, Lord, that we can look up 
know that you're coming. And look in and know you're at work in our hearts. And look out and know that you are with us in our relationships with one another. And we can look back knowing that you've shown your faithfulness over and over with all your people and with us. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name.